Hello, thank you for tuning in. The event and trade show industry got seriously hit with COVID-19. A lot of trade shows have been delayed or canceled, and a lot of companies are going out of business because their business model is relying on face-to-face -face marketing and how the, on the way we do business. My next guest has been working in the trade show industry, specializing in international trade shows for over 45 years. He studied at the Southern Illinois University in the early 70s under world designer Buckminster Fuller. And he recently wrote a book called Trade Shows from One Country to the Next, it's basically a review of doing face-to-face -face business in over 45 countries. Larry Kolchevik was the president of EDPA. He was the president of IFES, and he has worked with three of the top exhibit design companies in the USA. We're gonna be discussing a little bit about the future of the industry and some of the best practices that we can apply as design or exhibition professionals. I met Larry about 12 years ago in Paris at the IFS convention, and it was great to reconnect with him. Hope you enjoyed the episode. Okay, so Larry, welcome to my living Zoom. Uh, for those who don't know who Larry is, I'm gonna include the, the, the description in bio. Larry wrote one of the books that I would recommend to everybody about the exhibition industry. I'll also put links to that book in the bio. So Larry, for, the, for those who don't know you from the exhibition industry, how can you tell us a little bit by yourself? Well, I, I, 45 years ago, got a degree in design. I studied with a guy named Buckminster Fuller, and if you don't know who he is, Google him. Okay. He was one of the most ingenious designers who designed the geodesic dome. Wow. And uh, if, if you've ever gone to Disneyland in Orlando, that dome was uh, his design and also with the Montreal World's Fair. But he continued to talk about this thing called Spaceship Earth, that we're all on this spaceship and we have to work together with each other. And the whole time I was there, I said, what am I ever going to do with this? Yeah. It, it means nothing to me. Yeah. So lo and behold, I moved, got back to Chicago and didn't have a job. So I peddled fruit. I was a, a fruit peddler. At, I was a produce manager for AMP Foods, so it was, an, it was easy for me. Okay. Then I got a job designing exhibits in Chicago. And at that time, McCormick Place had just burned down. So McCormick Place burned down and there was these big shows, a houseware show, a hardware show. The, the biggest shows in the US were in Chicago. Yeah. So everybody needed a new exhibit for those that were storing them here in Chicago. But in, in any case, it started in Chicago and I haven't done anything after this. And wow. I've now worked for three of the largest exhibit companies in the United States, a Greyhound Exhibit Group, a Dursey Exhibits, and 3D Exhibits. And I always wanted to own my own company, but my wife would not let me do that. She said, you're not going to mortgage our, put our house up for collateral. So I never did. Hmm. But I had a good career as a result of it. Hmm. And because I was working for somebody else, I was, I had extra time to get involved with associations. Yeah. So I was very much involved with uh, EDPA. I was president of EDPA. Absolutely. And then I got involved with IFAS. Mm -hmm. And before IFAS, I was with uh, OSPI, the Octon Armed Service Partners. And that's where I triggered the idea for what can I do for IFAS. Wow. Now, when I joined IFAS, I, I became president. I was the first American, I'm the only American president for that matter. Uh, and as a result, met many, many people from all over the world, including you. Yeah, we met through IFAS. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And, and when I stopped being president, I said, you know, I know all these people. And I reached out to all of them. And I said, tell me, when I come to your country, how should I act differently? Mm. What customs should I follow? What rules and regulations do you feel are important for your region of the world? And lo and behold, nearly every one of them responded immediately. Mm. So here it was, I had 40 responses from 40 different countries. And then I took their words, put them into my own format and words, and wrote the book called Trade Shows from One Country to the Next. How do you act differently? What do you do different when going from one, one region to the other? The American region, of course, is probably the most difficult, uh, mm -hmm. um, even for Americans, for that matter. Mm -hmm. So this book is 45 different countries written by people from those countries, not me, 
No one person is the expert. I'm by no means the expert everywhere in the world, but it's not what you know, it's who you know Absolutely. that could help you on your way to. Uh, Absolutely. Well, I, I had, I had this book, I had this book uh, as I, as we spoke earlier, I think I had this book and I'm like, okay, well, the, the name seems familiar. You know, one of the, one of the guys in my company came in and like, ah, we bought this book and I'm like, wait a minute. <laughs> and, and then, and then it, it, and then all the dots started connecting and, and, and indeed we, we bought the book and we made everybody read it in the company. And, uh, and that's been our, Listen, it's a, it's a, it's you, everybody says it's a big world, but you have no idea how small it is. <laughs> You're absolutely yeah. right. In fact, I, this is the second edition and I probably am going to have to write a third edition now with all this, uh, with COVID-19. Yeah, exactly. We're not going to be shaking hands like we used to. Mm. So it will be different ways. And I'm, I, I should wait a bit to see exactly how this is all going to sort out. Yeah. But it's amazing the difference between the first edition, three years later, how much changed. Absolutely. In the, in the first edition, there was no Chinese uh, exhibition centers. There were a few. Now they're, they're the biggest and some of the most dynamic in the world. Absolutely. And many exhibition centers in Milan uh, changed and continued to change. Mm. And listen, so, let's let's but let's let's get to the topic. COVID nineteen. Like yes. there is there is not a there is not a day that God makes where I don't listen. What I don't see on my LinkedIn, some feed about somebody from the exhibition industry giving his two cents on COVID nineteen. And <laughs> of all people, I would like to speak with about COVID nineteen. I was so much waiting for this moment. How do you how do you see this affecting us as well, a, as an industry? Uh, it's probably one of the most major uh, situations I think we've ever faced, for that mm -hmm. matter, the whole world. Okay. And we've been through our industry different phases of of uh, crises. There was uh, economic crises with the banks going down in the United States, 2008. Uh, we've got to make these exhibits cheaper. Yeah, we've got to make them lighter. And all of a mm -hmm. sudden, portable exhibits and fabric exhibits and all kind of ideas came out as a result of a, a financial crisis. Yeah. So now we have a different kind of crisis, one of whereby we can't do what we profess is the, the magic of our industry, face-to-face -face yeah. communication. Yeah. Uh, so we're gonna develop new ways to communicate. Believe me, face-to-face -face communication is not gonna go away, mm. but it's not gonna come back instantly. But one of the things that I'm seeing in my industry, and there's different segments of the industry, there's organizers, there's exhibit suppliers, uh, uh, and then there's attendees. And we that are entrenched in the industry are so positive that things are just going to come back as they always have been. Yeah. Let's not kid ourselves. It's not going to be that easy. Mm. And those that are going to direct and steer where we go are the attendees. Yeah. It, it doesn't matter what kind of show we, we put on or how we lay it out. If nobody comes, it's, it's, the, it's the clients of your clients. Client. Right, so exhibitors are one thing, but attendees are the, the basis of area, why. Yeah. So until they get over the fear factor, and mm. at the moment the fear factor is travel, hotels, restaurants, getting in and out of a cab, uh, in the convention center itself uh, as being safe. Yeah. And when that begins to happen, things will begin to steer back in our direction. So until then, it's incumbent upon us within the industry to start designing new ways of communicating when, when it happens. Absolutely. And be patient. It's not going to happen. In Europe, in Europe, for example, one of the biggest issues is uh, not only the fear of the person that is going to go. I mean, I could be an employee in a company and I could say, OK, I mean, we'll go and we'll take all the necessary measures because basically not going out wearing a mask and wearing a gloves is not a viable business model for humanity. That, that's not how we evolved in the, in the fight against uh, viruses and microbes. We won because we prevailed, not because we hid away. Okay, let's say we wake up tomorrow and our exhibitors are going back. Now, we've covered they're that we're not going to do... They're, they're not afraid to travel. Yeah. Their companies have a budget that allows them to, 
Yeah, but that's not, out. but that's what I've been advocating for like now a month and a half uh, for now. It's like, it's not going to happen tomorrow. It, like it's, it's a couple of years, maybe three years. I mean, this is, this is a behavioral crisis. This is not a, exactly. This is not a financial crisis. Like if the money comes back, then we're not in crisis anymore. No, this is behavioral crisis. And it's going to take a lot of time. <laughs> it, it, it requires a new way to do the, the same thing. Yeah. Now, let me share with you, back, uh, got it, 20 years ago, I represented the city, the state of Illinois and the city of Chicago right. to promote their exhibits around the world. Okay. And there was a show they used to go to, it was called the Pow Wow Show. Okay. And so the state of Illinois would have uh, a, a booth of which the uh, uh, John Hancock, the, the city of Chicago, different uh, attractions within the state of Illinois were there. And they would have scheduled meetings. Mm. So on a certain time, you were scheduled for 1.15 to meet with the city of Chicago or whoever. And then a horn would go off every 20 minutes telling you you're done. Mm. On to the next meeting. Yeah, like a now, speed dating for exhibitions. It, right, so I'm thinking back on that and thinking, you know, that concept might have a place We'll have the exhibits, but we're mm -hmm. not having everybody just piling in whenever they want. They'll be scheduled and and steered at uh, yeah. arrive and go at certain times. Uh, so we're still fulfilling our, our desire for face-to-face -face communication, mm. but it's not going to be a, a step into a, a stand and say, uh, tell me, what do you do? No, no, no. The, the, these are, these days are over. We rely heavily on alternates to we're going to do some digital marketing companies yeah. will as much as I am not in favor of it. And as you know, maybe 10 years ago, uh, virtual trade shows made an attempt and, and it didn't work that, that great. Hmm. And the reason it doesn't work as great is there's one component that's missing that you don't get from what we're doing right now. We're talking over a computer and that's the element of emotion. Absolutely. There's no emotional connectivity. Absolutely communicating electronically, digitally, whatever. Absolutely. And you do get that in a trade show environment. If they solve it, if it's yeah. solved, if it's solved, it would be amazing. But I don't think it can be solved that easy. No. Yeah. So what we're capturing is this face-to-face -face communication in a stand that allows people to have emotional uh, attractions of which people buy on the basis of emotion. Mm. I mean, now, now it all depends what you're buying. Today, you can buy a car. I don't need to go to an auto show to decide what kind yeah. of car I'm going to buy. Yeah. I can see and uh, kick the tire. I, in fact, I don't know if we need auto shows. I'll, I'll, go, I'll go to a dealership. I'll, go, I'll, I'll exactly. watch some videos on YouTube, and I'll go get an emotion on dealerships. I'll go try the cars. I'll go try six, five cars in a dealership, and then I'll get my car. I don't need, I don't exactly. need General Motors to show me his events. Exactly. So, but then there are industries like fashion and yeah. such. You go to get, or you're in the houseware hardware business, you go to get ideas about what new things you could sell and meet new uh, buyers and sellers. And this. But really this is also fascinating to me. I mean, I mean, can you imagine walking into a cloth, clothing store? I mean, okay, you can buy a shirt on Amazon or any other the online shop if you know your size. I mean, you're. We're, right. We all know the, our sizes in brands like uh, Nike, Under Armour, whatever it is, right? But then you go to, if, if you want to go for an experience, if you want to go shopping for, as an experience and like you don't know what you're going to get, but you want to try a couple of things, I'm really curious in how companies are going to, to do that, actually. I mean, if I try on a shirt, are they going to provide an endless amount of shirts for people to try and every person is going to try a new shirt? Exactly. Or are we going to, because when you go now to shops, you end up wearing the same shirt that somebody else wore maybe last week, you know, <laughs> trying, trying it out. And we didn't mind that, but, but now we live in a, in a world where we're going to mind those things. And so I would guess in time that there'll be a tube you stand in and it takes all of your measurements. Maybe. Yeah. And with that comes your exact size. Yeah. That trying it on shouldn't matter. Now, what does matter is, and I know you, you may have had this experience buying shoes. Yeah, I wear a size 10, yeah. but the size 10 that's made in China versus it's not, yeah, exactly. isn't, this isn't fitting the same. So you yeah. need to, to 
the experience of feeling them. I, I don't want to hurt any brands now because they might become clients, but at some point I bought the exact same pair of shoes once I was traveling to Singapore and then I bought the exact same pair in, in France and one of them was made, I think, in Taiwan or Vietnam and the other one was made in Bangladesh. They were the same size, but one of them was bigger than the other in my shoes, in my yeah. feet, you know, like with my feet in it. So it was, it was really a, a funny and weird experience at the same time. Uh, you know, Larry, the other Larry. thing that we need to really consider, and that is what are the things that attract people to want to go to a trade show, a convention, a conference? And uh, I've come to the conclusion, these are the four things. Mm. For the attendee we're talking about. Absolutely. Now, number one is the location. Yep. Now, if somebody said to you, uh, the show is going to be in Orlando, Disneyland, Disney World. It's going to be in Las Vegas, gambling and shows and things. It's going to be in Chicago. Well, Chicago has its attractions as well. There's an emotional attraction about where that event is held. Or the shows in Paris. Absolutely. Or the shows in London. The, yeah. th these are cities that conjure up images in your mind. Uh, I want to go there and I want to bring my family, my girlfriend, my wife, my kids too. It, that's, it becomes... that's what all my clients do, by the way. <laughs> I mean, but, if, you, if you have a trade show in Paris, you're going to be there for 10 days for the build up, the installation, and then the dismantling. I mean, right? So let's not disregard the emotional attraction. That, it's not a, exactly a logical attraction when it comes to those that are paying your way to go. And number two, there's got to be a reason why you're going. And for many, the reason they're going isn't the trade show. It's the uh, seminars and such. A lot of industry, like the medical industry, that you, you need to continue the education units to maintain your license. Your, uh, Absolutely. Your, and, and going there for that reason is, is maybe the main reason you're going to the show. It's not the, the trade show. No. Now, what happens is that the trade show ends up being an attraction. Uh, I'm in between sessions. I, I might as well walk onto that show floor and, and see what's going on. And inevitably, what happens, uh, people arrive at what I call a eureka moment. Eureka! You yeah. discovered something you just yeah. didn't know. Yeah. I walked in, and this guy had this thing that measured my pulse, and all I needed to do was put it in my pocket. I couldn't believe this. You know, this and, now, and now I know. <laughs> yeah, you don't know what you don't know. Yeah, absolutely. And but trade show shouldn't be this magic. Uh, it, you should really have an idea in advance. And this is where the computer and pr preliminary meetings and digital communication will come in to complement the exhibit to the point where I'm going to the show and I'm going to see this particular exhibitor because mm. I want to know more about this X Y Z mm. uh, heartbeat measuring. Uh, device that initially and then by the way you, you saw six or seven other things that yeah. you didn't expect and uh, I mean lastly why people go is for networking yeah. and getting together with your peers talking about issues that may hey did you have the same problem that I have with this sort of depending on the industry yeah. and that peer relationship this is where your trust comes in uh, dealing with people it's face to face. That's mm. the people you trust the most are the people that you you've had eye contact with. Yeah, you've had absolutely. Absolutely. There's so many values in the whole concept of the trade show, as we call it, or conference and such, that can't be duplicated any other way. Mm. And that's the thing we're all trying to protect and get back into doing once again. Yeah. Uh, now, you know, you and I started, at least I did designing exhibits, it was all about architecture. Yeah. And architecture was, hey, a beautiful stand and uh, Absolutely. how do I build it? And, and believe me, it didn't take long that that stand is nothing more than an excuse for someone to spend some time in your space. Yeah, and, and then people realize that it's worse to have, it, that you can have the most beautiful stand in the world if the coffee machine just stops working when you're receiving an important person, then, then yeah. with, that, that's Armageddon. Right. <laughs> I'll be, I'll be, you know, you're absolutely right, especially if you're in Europe. Yeah. In the United States, you know, the whole concept of serving coffee is done, but it's just not done to the degree it is, particularly in Germany and Italy. Oh, or Italy. Yeah. Go to Italy well, and try Germany, having a, a, a real glass and a real cup. And a, if, you know, if, if you don't have that on a stand, you can lose some leads. Actually, you can really lose business because you don't adapt to this. Uh, that, that's, yeah. not, that's not that's science like, fiction. 
So many of my American customers would serve coffee and they're, they're pouring it in a paper cup. I said, what are you doing that for? They, they get the coffee and they leave. Yeah. If it's in a glass. They'll stay cup, until it's you're, finished. You're self-aware. Yeah. <laughs> They'll sit and talk. And, that, yeah. and all the, the exhibits in Europe have uh, three things. A, a, have a bar or a sitting area. They have raised floors, and I'll tell you why. And they have private meeting rooms. Now, these kind of things are sometimes implemented into the American exhibits, but mm. in, in Europe, it's a, it's a requirement. Now, a raised floor, for example, for years and years, uh, Europeans would come to the United States and say, Larry, I need a raised floor. And I said, I can save you $10,000 if we just put a carpet and a pad down. And they said, Larry, you don't understand. The raised floor is a signal of importance. Absolutely. You're stepping into my kingdom. Yep. You're stepping into my space. Yep. That's what it's all about. It isn't hiding the electric cords or super yeah. flat. And I, it took me five years to realize how I was missing the whole concept of why a raised floor. And the, the whole idea of a bar too. And you yeah. think about if you're invited over to someone's house, uh, number of couples or people, where does everybody congregate? They go into the kitchen, kitchen. they stand by this person who's trying to make dinner for you and everybody's standing around the bar having a drink. Yeah. But it's something that you gravitate to because it's a comfort zone for communication. Absolutely. You want to sit on the couch in a stiff mode and uh, they want to be able to I mean, it's a difference between eating and dining. Are you, yeah. going, there to eat? Are you going there to dine? Dine means there's conversation, there's Absolutely. protocol, there's waiters. Uh, Absolutely. There's experience. And, Absolutely. And, and the experience is really what attracts you. I can't tell you how many places I've gone to that had a great environment, had a great owner that greeted me, but their food was only mediocre. Yeah. I overlook the mediocre food. <laughs> absolutely, <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Important. At some point, you stop caring about the food. Yeah. And you know? Right now, it's all carry out, and uh, it's a it's a different life we're all living. And uh, mm. we are just like uh, if we're. I, I think if we're not grasping the change, we're gonna we're gonna just miss out uh, on on the change of this. And I mean, here in the United States, companies like Ford, uh, Motorola. Uh, they, they are taking, uh, Ford, for example, is making ventilators. Yeah. They're not set up to do it, but they figured it out, and now they're in the ventilator business. Yeah. Uh, and they're adapting their, their, their skills on a production line to making other things. Yeah. So from all this, there's going to be a bright light. We need to all adapt. I don't know about you, but every, every time I put a face mask on, uh, I still feel kind of awkward, but mm. I I know why I do it. It's mm. protection of myself and, and others or whatever. Mm. Mm. But uh, we, we're getting used to it, I guess is my point. And yeah. uh, I'm not sure if I like the fact that I'm- Well, some, some people in Europe are getting used to it and are actually expecting to eradicate the regular flu. I mean, it, it's, I mean if, yeah. if everybody ends up wearing masks until December, we might just have a season without flu this year. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, you know, like everybody's taking it with a sense of humor. I mean, it's, listen, I think, I think a, a, lot of, a lot of what humanity has to face has to come gradually. So there's, of course, fear. We're, we're, we're social animals. We're social animals. We're driven by fear. We're driven by emotion. So, I mean, we're all, we all thought, oh, come on, it's not the death rates compared to humanity. And, and then we sat down and for one blink of a second is like, what if it's me? What if it's my grandma? What if it's my grandpa? Okay, I'm going to wear the, the mask, you know? And so... And we got used to it. By the way, that's a great idea when shows come back. If you're a show organizer or a sponsor... Absolutely. You make the masks put with your logo on them. Absolutely. Everybody's walking around with your mask and your logo. Absolutely. Well, the USBs and pens will be replaced by right. masks yeah. and hand sanitizers and, you know, like... I, th I think that's where the industry is going. I mean, we are crazy enough to create those things. Marketer marketers ruin everything, Larry. You know, yeah. marketers ruin everything. At first it was the billboard, then it was Facebook ads, and now it's going to become the mask. So <laughs> Exactly. Now, I'm, I'm looking to see what the new way of greeting someone will be, because it certainly isn't shaking hands. Yeah. Uh, I, I went to the doctor the other day for my yearly checkup, and the, the, the nurse, she, she did an elbow pump with me. Okay. Oh, hey, that, maybe that's the way. 
Uh, the other thought I, I had is back in the day when everybody wore hats, especially here, I'm mm. in uh, Denver, Colorado, cowboys are a big deal. But in those days, everybody had a brimmed hat, and they'd say, howdy, ma'am. Howdy, they'd ma'am, yeah. Hat, and they'd say, howdy. Yeah. Uh, today, people don't wear hats, so there's no nothing to mm. grab onto for howdy. But it might be some hand signal, like yeah. this or, or something. Yeah. But we'll create that new engaging uh, hey, I'm okay, you're okay, engagement that greets each other. Now, mm. in Asia, that's the, uh, it's uh, bowing. Yeah. Which, the, I, the, nothing wrong with that. Nothing, nothing wrong with, with that. Right? <laughs> in, 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 the, in the Middle East, I know that from, from some cultures, Jordan, if you're, if you're far away from the person, just a, a, a small head nod is enough to, to recognize your, you know, it's to, it, it's, I, I recognize your presence and I respect your presence. And that's more than okay. enough. I mean, you don't, you don't go around so chasing these people. The kind of things that we're going to change without, in time, will be, uh, it'll be normal and acceptable. Mm. As I said, I, I feel awkward with the mask, but in time, it'll be second nature. It's not something, I hope I don't have to, that's going to be the way. But it, if it is, then I'll yeah. adapt. As yeah. Everyone, as we all will. Yeah, Larry. From from what you've seen before, and from like from your eye to the world and to companies that because you're interacted obviously with a lot of colleagues and a lot of people in the industry, and so now let's let's just say you are let's let's assume you're running a company of ten, fifteen, twenty, thirty uh, people, uh, and everybody's getting ready to get back to work, right? And everybody's getting ready to this new normal, right? What would be in your opinion, the essential three measures as a manager in a company that is handling, at the end of the day, it's a people's business. So what would be the three, three, four measures that you would advise every team leader, even if he's not the CEO of the big company, but every team leader, whether he's a stand builder, whether he's a designer, whatever he is, what can you say to them? I, I think number one would be respect for your customer. And, and a, now in the United States, for example, you're a Republican or you're a Democrat. Mm. And sometimes people are afraid to say which side they're on. Because they're going to lose business. <laughs> yeah, you don't want to get into that as being a reason why you're losing business. Yeah. But being sensitive to your customer and what are their needs. Yeah. Some companies might be a little more uh, <clears throat> sensitive about letting their employees go to a show okay. or the budget or whatever. So be, get, make sure you understand where are they at. Because okay. we're ready to rock and roll in the industry here. And mm -hmm. they not, they're not on the same page. Yeah. So number one, I want all my employees to feel uh, any customer we're talking to, any, that we know exactly where they stand on this issue okay. and how we adapt to that. Okay. Uh, more so than, and, and secondly, that they are, your customers are aware that you're, you've been thinking about this a long time. This isn't something that's just thrown at you. Absolutely. You've got ideas and solutions and alternatives for them to consider that it, you're not trying to sell them something, you're trying to make it easier for this trade show as we used to know it, and how is it different? How can I help them? Absolutely. Because believe me, most of the, the, the customers as we go forward in the next couple of years are gonna have their budgets reduced. Mm -hmm. I don't think exhibits are gonna be as big as they are. Yeah. So as much as you wanna make money and sell a big exhibit, be sensitive to your customer. You know, I don't think you should, you need a double deck exhibit. No. Uh, I think uh, you should just focus on making your clients money. I think, exactly. I think if you focus on making your clients money, I mean, let me help you on a trade show so that you can succeed your campaign and so that you sell as much as you can and more than your competitors. And if you make money, great, then I'll make money in the process as well. So. Exactly. But that human element is really it still has to be. Uh, yeah. A lot of empathy, be. a lot of empathy towards the clients. Now, a lot of small companies, uh, believe it or not, the average size company in the United States exhibit suppliers is $7 million. That's okay. not a lot of money. That's no. not a big business. No. Now, there are big companies, uh, uh, Freeman and GES. Yeah, and, uh, we're uh, talking Christine. millions and billions. Yeah, they, they are, they're in a different level of, uh, of, of service and of financial security as well. Mm. But with that in mind, you know, we have to step slowly. Mm. And uh, a lot of companies are not going to be able to continue to, you know, pick up where they left off. Okay. As much as they're getting a check in the mail from uh, the government. Yeah. It's, yeah. That's just certainly not enough. 
It's, it is the case in Europe, by the way. By the way, the case really? in Europe is basically, well, to, I, I think, I think it was the French uh, Minister of Economy who went on TV once and said about, about a month ago, he went on TV and said, um, uh, I urge big, com big corporations of more than, let's say, half a billion dollar valuation or, or turnover to pay for the services in the creative industry and in the events industry, even if the service wasn't delivered. Right. So like just it was on your budget for this year. Just pay it because you'll be saving jobs and Good you'll point. be saving people. And it will give give because the exhibition industry is not a immediate industry. It's not like a shop. I mean, a shop is closed. It's closed now. But I mean, uh, now I can start preparing for exhibitions in 2021 to 22. Right. And so as long as I can have this length of cash flow as a business to, to, to be able to sustain, I might be able to bounce back as opposed to a restaurant that is, if he's closed for three months, he's closed for three months. Exactly. And you and I are not going to eat three times at the same restaurant a day just to bring back the money. I mean, this money is lost, you know? You're absolutely right. And I think figuring out different ways to, to apply your skills, uh, maybe you, you do retail uh, construction, maybe you do museum design, maybe you have a, yeah. uh, you make uh, baby uh, wooden toy yeah. carrier. Yeah. Come up with a product yeah. that can keep your people busy and make yeah. money in the meantime that yeah. Uh, yeah. allows you to stay, stay afloat. Yeah. Because I really believe that it's going to be 2021 late, late, that it's going to come back to the degree that, yeah. and again, it has to do with the attendee and their willingness and their, 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 the green light is on with their fears that they're not uh, afraid to, to get on an airplane and not afraid to go in a restaurant. They're yeah. not afraid. Uh, but I've invested so much of my career in, yeah. in international now. Yeah. And I was a bit ahead of the concept in mm -hmm. the United States. I mean, no exhibit companies were getting involved much in international because I was working for Greyhound Exhibit Group, uh, mm -hmm. the largest exhibit companies. They supported it. And, and really, I had the opportunity to get this, to know the rest of the world is out there. Now, most all exhibit companies in the United States are selling internationally, mm -hmm. but the degree they're selling internationally is still much less than the rest of the world is selling internationally. Of course. And because I've invested so much energy and all of a sudden this happens, uh, in a way, I'm glad I'm retired <laughs> <laughs> because it is so, uh, oh no, uh, and it should I, all be part of uh, coming up with solutions. Uh, it shouldn't be totally on your shoulder as the manager to, to come up with how should we reposition our resources. Mm. Like in asking your own employees their opinion, what you're doing is they're, you're getting them to be part of your team. Absolutely. And that's what you want. You want Absolutely. people to feel they're part of the team Absolutely. Uh, and not just an employee. It's and not an us and them. It's not an us and them. No, nor is it every opinion that someone has that you yeah yeah uh, to weigh those things yeah but we're, we're going through a difficult time and i think our industry will get through it but it, mm. it, the idea is that we don't lose the best of our people and the best of our ideas yeah uh, before it come the green light comes back on yeah uh, to me, betting against the, I mean, if you bet against big corporations in the United States, it's like what Warren Buffett said, you're betting against America. So for those companies to fail, it means that America will fail. And so I think for the exhibition industry, betting on the failure of the industry is basically betting against human interaction. Uh, I mean, it, it, good point. You know, I mean, if you're betting against human interaction, okay, I'll, I'll give it. You're hedging against human interaction. So we're going to live in bubbles and we're going to be in virtual land and we're not going to interact. Exactly. Fine. Then the exhibition industry will be dead. No problem. But the one thing that I'm growing softer to is the whole digital virtual communication. Mm. That there's a balance between, you know, I was mm. totally against it 10 years ago and now I'm yeah. kind of warming up to the fact that. Is the, maybe the technology convinced you? What made Pardon? you change your mind? Well, the, the human touch, I think, was miss, totally missing. I mean, I, okay. I'm sure you about Facebook or LinkedIn or whatever. Absolutely. Absolutely. It, it has its merits, but there's no emotionalness about it. Mm. How many times do you, you type something to someone in response, and then it, it would, they just read it all wrong? <laughs> yeah. Well, it, it, didn't happens, mean it happens that. every day. It wasn't a criticism. It was no. a comment, and I... 
and they didn't have a chance to. Uh, yeah. in, in any case, the, I think companies will start to use digital uh, communication and combine that to enhance the, the benefit and value of the actual trade show. That means when they're coming to that show, they've already done their homework in advance all about you. Absolutely. They set up a meeting to see you. They have Absolutely. questions about what you, things you can provide for them. They're not walking into your space saying, tell me what you do. Spot they're on. Saying, tell me about those X32s that I read about and why do you think it could work for me in uh, New Absolutely. Jersey? Absolutely. Uh, that's an intelligent question. You're starting off, hey, running with it. And yeah. your chances of doing something at that point yeah. It results in money. At what point do you think in the, in, in economically speaking, companies will say, okay, like now we just have to organize each other and take a little bit of risk. Of course. Well, it's and I think that's what exactly is going to happen. Okay. Uh, I'd say by the end of this year, there'll be, there's a big show. The biggest one in the United States is called the IMTS show. Yes. International Machine Tool Show. Yes. yes. Every two years. And at this point, they're not canceled. But one of the things that is that many of those companies that exhibit and buy are international companies. Mm. So I question, you know, okay, are we still going to go through with it? But, but I hope they do because I think we're going to overreact when we first start getting back to trade shows. We're going to be doing the whole mask and six foot yeah. distancing and all these things that uh, are a bit awkward or whatever. And then gradually we're, we're going to eliminate one or two of those things and we're going to get more comfortable with the idea of being it's like it's like traveling to me it's like traveling i remember i was i i came to france in 2001 and i landed in france on the 15th of september 2001 just four days after 9 11. wow and and i stayed at the airport three days because i was coming from lebanon there was it was it was just the state of the world i mean there were countries on the on the planet that were controlling people at the airports a little bit more because everybody was skeptical and scared, right? And, and at some point for three, four years, we were all getting basically stripped at the, at the airports uh, for the yeah. water bottle and for, the, and now if you go travel in Europe, you, you, if you go travel in Europe, either I don't feel that anymore because I got used to it or it, it, or it, got, or it got a little bit lighter, you know, like some, uh, okay, it's fine. What, what is this, a, a perfume bottle? It's fine, you can take it on, it's not a problem. You right. see what I mean? Exactly. And so, and so, and so, I think, as you said, I think the companies will just gradually, and it will take a few brave, to just say, okay, we have to go through this, and right, especially if you're coming back with business. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> wow, well, I went there. I I didn't catch the corona, and by the way, I, I sold two million dollars worth of yeah, widget. and I created ten thousand jobs. So you yeah. know. So I think there's going to be a balance, and there's going to be. A, a compromise. I mean, we see this in our in the United States. Sports is a real big thing, and it's sports is big in Europe. But you know, soccer is the yeah. football, as you call it. Yeah. Uh, and the baseball season is about to start. Now they're starting in South Korea. Yeah. Uh, but they're a different situation in the U.S. They're going to spread where you sit, how you sit. Some of the games will be played with maybe no one in the stand. But in time, gradually, it will get back to what it was. Mm. Uh, I believe. And the question is how much time, but it's good that we're starting the process of getting back. Yeah. And, and anybody that we talk to that continues to say, we don't need trade shows, digital will take its place. I, I, I don't want to talk to you. <laughs> yeah. No, no. <laughs> I, I, I can understand we don't need trade shows. You buy things on Amazon, fine. I just want you to make a purchase of your, I mean, everything you can purchase with money, you'll buy maybe digitally, but the human interaction, I mean. Right, and remember there, there, there's more than just going to a trade show floor. These the educational sessions are, are required for a lot of industries and they're yeah. priceless for continued education. Networking is also priceless. And meeting people that could help you to help yourself in other ways. You wouldn't have met this person if you didn't put yourself in that situation. We're going to have both. We're going to have both. I mean, you go to an auto show, instead of having a company taking 4,000 square meters to exhibit 25 cars, they're going to take 500 square meters and exhibit five cars, right? And then they're going to create some digital game where they're going to host a webinar during the show or prior to the show. And they're going to create like an online game where people can connect, right? And so you won't see those conferences where somebody's standing, speaking behind a microphone and 200 people in front of him. You're going to have a Zoom conference where somebody's speaking and you'll have people. 
fine. But I don't think exhibit houses will close and no. venues will close and become hospitals. I mean, that's just not a viable business model for humanity. If it, the same reason you don't go to a trade show is the same reason you wouldn't go to a restaurant is the same reason you wouldn't go to a mall is the same reason you wouldn't go to a shop. So closing down, betting on the end of the exhibition industry is exactly like betting on, I'm not going to go to a bar anymore. Yeah. A, a, a good example. But I think in time it's going to change slowly to the point where we're back. But yeah. uh, do it. We're going to be doing it different. And yeah. I'm all for that. That's for sure. We're going to do different now. It's probably better. Yeah. Yeah, now one of the things I think, um, speaking uh, for United States exhibit companies, that it, when people are going back to exhibits, I don't think they're going to be wanting to spend the degree of money. Their budgets are going to be cut. The economic yeah. uh, hardships are going to be for a while. Yeah. So what's going to be attractive? And I think total rental exhibits, custom rental, okay, that are that are turnkey. Okay. And I mean turnkey. And now this is probably nothing di- new for you in Europe, but in the yeah. United States. It's a la carte. You you pay for your drayage. Uh, you pay electric separately. Yeah. You want one price. I know what that exhibit is, uh, you, and that's it. And I, can I don't want I don't want surprises. I want something that is custom. I don't want it too custom to be expensive, but I want it custom enough for me to showcase my brand. Give me a price. Exactly. I don't want surprises. I don't like surprises. I bought you thirty thousand, and it costs thirty thousand. And not to pay. But I didn't realize you were sending in all these extra products. Uh, yeah. That, your extra for electricity yeah. and, and drainage. Uh, yeah. So that is, I think is going to help the U.S. assimilate with the rest of the world because Maybe. it's the U.S. problem uh, on this budgeting uh, unknown components. Yeah. Uh, labor is charged by the hour, and uh, I had to work overtime, so I got to charge you more. Yeah. Uh, that shouldn't be. You, it's, it, I think it's just get the job done. We got three days of buildup. The hours of buildup are between eight o'clock in the morning and five o'clock in the afternoon. We need to get the job done. If you get it done in two days, congratulations, have a day off. If yeah. you can't. This isn't the time for, for roadblocks. Yeah. I mean, I'm cautious about going to a show to begin with. And now you're going to tell me I, I got to pay you a little extra. Yeah. So make it easier for them to yeah. be willing to get back into the game. And, and yeah. So some more transparency, some more integrity, and some more empathy towards clients. I think that's the, these are the three, you know, so. You know, yesterday I got an email from uh, IFAS, and uh, I, I'm a member of IFAS. Uh, as your president, you're a member for life, which is mm. one of the byproducts. Yeah. But in any case, uh, Ufi just did a, a research study about procedures for the corona and for shows, which I thought mm. was, have a look at it. Um, in the United States, they, they are doing kind of their own. Mm. Which these two should really be working together. There shouldn't yeah. be a, a European standard for safety. Uh, yeah. COVID and the US a different thing. We're, we're back to drayage and, and Absolutely. our differences. So I want the whole world to be this one world market. You know? okay. And that was always my dream. Yeah. You, you have a one world market and maybe I could sell more shoes in Bangladesh than I could in, uh, uh, in Paris. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You find where's your market, where can I buy, sell, and, and we're working throughout the world and, yeah. and working with some level of trust, not yeah. getting screwed. That's, 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 that's something like if, if we go, if we get started on this, we're going to need another hour for it. So, okay. it's, so or maybe another even week. Larry, even, even my, my book, I don't have to belabor it, but the theme of my book is there's no right way. There's no wrong way. There's only a different way. Yeah. Understand and respect what is different and you're on your way to success. It's we, we, the Americans in particular, want everything to be what you don't take American money, what you don't have hamburgers, uh, yeah. you know, understand why it's that way, respect why it's that way. And that goes with bowing, handshakes, hugging, all these kind of things. They're adjust, mm. yeah, and, and you're, you'll be fine. Mm. Uh, and that goes true for the rest of the world. We all mm. have to acknowledge and respect our differences. Great. And our differences. I'm trying. Everything's not always going to be the same. Absolutely, Larry. I'm going to end on these words. I mean, this, this, this resonates with me so much. I am. I am personally. I'm. I'm an immigrant in every country I live in. You know, I'm Lebanese. I lived in France, Spain, and and Bulgaria, for more than 
six years in each country. So that's, that's exposure. And what you're saying is very much resonating to me. I don't, when I come into a country, I, I, I am embracing the culture of the country and I'm, I understand that I'm not home. I'm a guest first. And then right. maybe I can be extend my guesthood and maybe I can call this place home someday. Right. But first, acknowledge that I'm a guest, right? So that's the, exactly. Yeah. I think that's the first. Uh, well, I don't know that we've solved all the problems of the COVID, but mm. believe me, in the next two months, we're going to start seeing ideas coming from everywhere mm. about how uh, we suggest to, to move forward. Yeah. And between all those ideas will come some solutions that we'll yeah. agree to abide yeah. by and, and, yeah. and continue it forward. Yeah. Larry, thank you so much. I'm Thank you for watching this video. I hope it brought you some value. If you would like to engage, please leave a comment in the comment section. You can also click the subscribe button and activate notification to receive the updates on this channel.